time this morning? Yeah. I got to warn y'all that here's a little, uh, what do they call it? A little uh, disclaimer. You know, I was in, the, was in a little bit of pain this week. I had a root canal earlier this week, part one of two. I have a bone, bone contusion. Uh, it's pretty painful, so I'm not going to be walking around as much as I usually do, but I had to take some medication this morning and it made me feel a little funny. And so uh, don't hold me responsible for everything I say if it starts to sound a little funny. But uh, I'm feeling good this morning. Uh, it was a beautiful morning this morning. We woke up early. Uh, Vesta and I had some uh, pictures scheduled, some maternity pictures scheduled with a photographer this morning over at a park. I can't remember the name of that park. Monument something park. And it was beautiful with the sun coming up and the, the mountains just reflecting. And you know, I'm looking there at my wife and she's beautiful and she's pregnant. Y'all give me a minute. I'm just going to get some uh, cool points for a second. But I'm looking at it and I'm like, man, I, I really love that woman. And you know, she's sitting there, she's smiling, and we got a baby coming in a couple of weeks. And you just, it couldn't be, it couldn't be better than what it was this morning. Just a perfect morning. I got the perfect woman. And, you know, I, I might always look good on the outside, but I'm not always good on the inside. And, and I, I'm thankful that I have a woman, you know, who, who loves me like First Corinthians chapter 13 does. And she she endures a lot of things dealing with, you know, a knucklehead like me. And I just want to thank her for that. And I, I really appreciate that. And the way that I feel this morning, I want everybody to feel that way. And uh, I just I just had to share that with y'all this morning. But uh, this morning, I want to first of all thank all the brothers who's uh, participated in the worship services so far. I thank uh, Brother Hall for the singing, and uh, Brother Al for the scripture reading, Brother Miller for the prayer. And we're going to continue to worship God this morning. And we're going to be coming from John chapter 11. We're going to be talking about Lazarus this morning. And in this text is what's known as the shortest verse in the Bible. We're going, to, we're going to be talking about crying a little bit this morning. We're going to be talking about weeping a little bit this morning. And uh, it's, it's all right to cry sometimes. And like Brother I will tell you, just keep living. Everybody's going to cry you know, sometimes. No matter what it is, there's something that's going to make you cry. There's something that you're going to feel passionate about that's going to make you cry sometimes. And sometimes people will make you cry, you know. So when I remember when I was a kid getting whoopings, your mother would make you cry. No matter how hard you try to hold those tears back, you know, and what's the first thing they say when you start crying when they give you a whooping? You gotta stop crying before I give you a reason to cry. And that that was one of the most frightening things I've ever heard. Because you just hit me upside the head with this cordless phone. And I'm not talking about cordless phones like today, I'm talking about a 1996 cordless phone that weighed about four pounds. You know, it, when you say I'm gonna give you a reason to cry after that, that, that gets me a little worried. But you, you're gonna cry sometimes, and, and that's okay. Uh, I saw a bumper sticker the other day that said, "Real men can cry." Yes. You know, and, and that's okay. And, and I think some of the, the females need to be a little concerned about saying, "I want a man who's sensitive." You know. But, you know, you want a man who's sensitive until somebody breaks into the house, right? Then you want a strong man. You gotta, if your man's too sensitive, then both y'all be hiding in the closet crying. <laughs> you want a strong man. But it's okay to cry sometimes. Sometimes there's reasons to cry. And in the text we find here in John chapter 11, verse 35, someone get it for me real quick. <clears throat> Go ahead and read it when you got it. Jesus Christ. Jesus cried. That verse says Jesus wept. Not only is that the shortest verse in the Bible, but I might say that that might be the most contrasting verse in the Bible. Just those two words, that two-word sentence starts with Jesus, all power. He has all power in his hands, the most powerful man to ever walk the earth, the most perfect man to ever walk the earth. You have all that power there in that first word. And then in that second word, you have weeping. You have what some people might consider the, a weak word. So you have the shortest verse in the Bible. You also have the most contracting or contrasting uh, verse. And people cry for a lot of reasons. Some people cry because there's they lack the ability to change something that they're not happy about. People cry at funerals because they've lost a loved one 
and there's nothing that they can do about it. They, they, they're feeling hurt and they're filled with remorse because they've lost that person that they care so much about and they just feel helpless. And a lot of times they end up calling on who? Jesus. They end up calling on him for help because they know that he's a source of strength. But here we have Jesus crying. But he's not crying for the reason that we might think he's crying. If we read in verse 36, who's got verse 36? <coughs> Go ahead and read it. So the Jews said, see how much he loved him. See, what's going on here is Lazarus. You guys remember the story of Lazarus? I'm trying not to walk around. Fall down <coughs> You remember, the book, you remember the story of Lazarus? Lazarus was one of Jesus' best friends. He was one of Christ's best friends. And he had gotten the word that Lazarus had died. And, the, and Martha and Mary had sent word to Jesus through his disciples saying, Jesus, Lazarus is sick. We need you right now. We need you to come and help out your friend. And at this time, Jesus had just, been, had just left Bethany. The, the Jews were threatening his life. And he's out there with his disciples, and he's going to decide to wait a couple of days. And he waited two days before he decided to go see about Lazarus. And he waited two days, and he's going back to the city of Bethany, and his own disciples are saying, what are you doing? They just tried to kill you. We just got out of there alive, and now you want to go back. You know, and the disciples said, well, if he's going to go back, you know, they considered it a suicide mission. And they said, if he's going to die, then we're going to die with him. But it was a two-day journey. It was a two-day journey back to Bethany, and he went back anyway. But when, by the time he's gotten there, his friend has died. And the Jews are saying, look at him. Look how much he loved him. He loved him so much, he was crying. But that's not why he was crying. He was crying because his friends had hurt him. He wasn't crying because he had just lost Lazarus. It was, it was no, no, death is not a thing for Jesus. Jesus has already shown that he can bring people back from the dead. He's not crying because his friend has died. Jesus is crying because his friends have hurt him. And let me explain. They're mad because, you know, Martha and Mary are mad because he didn't show up when, he want, when they wanted him to. He didn't show up when they called him. And I'm, I'm going to tell you this morning that just because Jesus has delayed in answering your prayers doesn't mean that he's denied your prayers. Delay does not mean denied. We want to look at things on our own time. We want things to happen right now. When I call them, I want you to be there right now. We need you right now, Jesus. We, 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 we sent you a text message four days ago, and you haven't shown up. Why didn't, you, why didn't you come when you could have done something about it? He's died. You've done this for other people. You, 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 you showed up and healed sick people, and we're your friends. We're your friends, and you didn't, you didn't show up and say and Jesus is, Jesus is sitting there, and he's listening to Martha. Mary didn't even come out of the house. She stayed in the house. But he's listening to Martha, and she's, and she's arguing with Jesus. We want him to show up on our time. But he, so he's crying in verse number 35, but not because Lazarus is dead. He's crying because they did not trust him. The thing about Christ is he's not going to force you to love him. You know, who, who, wants some, who wants a love like that? That's an arranged marriage. When you have to force somebody to love you, when you have to force somebody to like you, when you have to get them to want to be with you, no one wants that kind of relationship. Jesus wants you to trust him. You know, and since they didn't trust him, it has hurt him. And the scripture says that Jesus wept. There's nothing weak about that because if you have compassion about certain things, it's okay to cry about those things. It's a, you're supposed to cry when you see things that uh, affect you passionately. When you see your children sick, it's okay to cry sometimes. When you see your parents not being able to come to their kids' high school graduation because they're in a nursing home, it's okay to cry about those things. That's not a sign of weakness. But Jesus isn't crying for those reasons. He's crying because they don't trust him. And when he, when he looks back at all the things that he has done, when he, those same two people, he's, he spent the night in their house. He's ate their food, and this is why Martha's mad. If anybody you should have saved, it should have been us. If anybody you should have taken care of, Jesus, you've been here, you slept in our bed, we gave you the guest bedroom, we made food for you to eat, and you couldn't come when we wanted you to come. And Jesus is thinking in his mind, how many times do I have to show you? 
How many times do I have to show you that I'm going to make it right? How many times do I have to? Lord, by this time, he stinketh, for he hath been dead four days. Jesus said unto her, said, I not unto thee, that if thou wouldst believe, thou shouldest see the glory of God. Uh-huh. He read? He read. Okay, then they took away the stone from the place where the dead was laid. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me. And I knew that thou heardest me always. But because of the people which stand by, I said, that they may believe that thou hast sent me. See, when you want things to happen, we, we think it's all about us sometimes, don't we? When, we? when we want things to happen, we want them to happen for our own selfish reasons. You know, God sees more than that. You know, just because you think that thing needs to happen right now, and it might benefit you if it does happen right now, God sees what the overall benefit will be. When he sees that, and everyone else sees that there's nothing else that could be done, when you've exhausted all of your resources, when everyone's prayed as much as they can pray and still nothing has happened, then he wants to step in. Because it's never too late for him. We think it's too late for us, but it's never too late for him. And he gives the thanks to his father first, and he does that in front of all of them, and he says, I did this so that you could be glorified. This was his best friend. You don't think that he wanted his friend to live? He wanted his friend to live just as much as Mary and Martha wanted their brother to live. But he went through this suffering with them. When we are suffering, we are not suffering alone. Christ comes down into our suffering with us. He says, if you abide in me, and I, I will abide in you. He feels the same pains that we feel. But he knows what is about to happen. And what's about to happen. What does he say at the rest of that verse? And, then, and, when, he, and when he thus had spoken, he cried with a loud voice, mm-hmm. Lazarus, Lazarus, come forth. Come forth. And he that was dead came forth, bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was bound about with a napkin. Jesus said unto him, Loose him and let him go. His man who's been dead for four days. There in mourning. They've had the funeral. You know, everybody's ate all the collard greens. They've eaten all the food and the dishes been put away. And people are still in mourning. And they think there's nothing else to be done. And all it took was for Jesus to open his mouth. And he said, Lazarus, come forth. And you know why he said Lazarus, don't you? You know, because he has so much power. God has so much power in his hands. If he didn't call him by his name, the whole cemetery would have came forth. If he would have just said, servant, get up, all of the whole cemetery would have came forth. And Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Nehemiah, they all would have came up because he has that much power in his hands. But he called them by his name. And we need to think about that. Stop, stop worrying about so much about what other people call you. Don't worry about what other people have to say about you. Because Christ calls you by who you are. He says, you are my, what? You are my brother. You are God's children. It doesn't matter what else people call you. You belong to God. Listen to what Christ calls you. He says, Lazarus, get up. And Lazarus got up just like nothing had happened. He took those, he took the bindings off of him and he walked on his way. And can you imagine the looks on their faces? And this wasn't the first time that they've had these looks on their faces because Christ has done this before. There's a story about uh, when the, the devil had a conversation with Jesus and he said, you know, Jesus, he said, you know, you've, I've seen you do a lot of things. You, you know, you've, you've walked on water and I've seen you heal sick people and, and you, felt a multi, you fed a multitude of 20,000 people with nothing but a lunchable. You know, and that's all right, and that's all right. But I'm wondering, I wonder, Jesus, if you have enough power to bring somebody back uh, from the dead. And, and Jesus said, uh, I'm glad you asked me. He said, I'm on my way over to Jairus' house. He said, and then, and then he went over to this house, and there's a little girl, and she's, the Bible says she's at the point of death. And Jesus kicked everybody out of the house, and he told her, uh, little girl, get up. He just told her, little girl, 
get up. And the Bible says that she got up, sat up, and then she was eating, just like a little hungry teenager. She, the Bible says she was 12 years old, and she's eating, and she was just at the point of death. You know, and the, the devil says, well, that's okay, that's all right. You know, you got her at the point of death. You know, but I, I'm wondering if you can get somebody after they've already been died. And, and Jesus says, well, I'm glad you asked me because I just got a text message. I'm on my way over to Nain. You know, he says, follow me over to the city of Nain. And, and, and there's, a, there's a funeral procession going on. A widow's son has died. And Jesus, Jesus stops the funeral procession. They're on their way to the cemetery. They're on their way to the grave. And he stops the procession. And he opens up the door and he puts his hand on that coffin and tells the boy to get up. And the boy got up and got out of the coffin and he's walking around. And Jesus, just like that, with the sound of his voice, turned a funeral into a family reunion. That is the power that he has in his hands. And the devil looks at him and he says, you know what, that's, that's pretty good. That's all right. He says, but I'm wondering if you can get somebody who's been already in the grave. And he said, he said that's all right. Follow me all over to Bethany. He said, I just got a Facebook status update. My boy Lazarus, he's passed on. He said, but hold tight here for a few days. We're going to wait just a little while. It's been two days, and we're going to travel there, Satan. I want you to come with me, because what I'm about to do, you will see that I have all the power in my hands. And he, he comes up to him, and, and Martha's approaching him. He shoes Martha away. He says, show me where he's at. Show me where you laid him. Move the stone out of the way. And when he said it, he said, Lazarus, rise up. And Lazarus got up, and he came out of those bindings. He'd been dead for four days, and Satan's looking at him. Well, that's pretty good, Jesus. He said, you, you, you got somebody at the point of death. You, you, you got somebody right after they died. And now here it is, you've raised Lazarus, and he's been dead for four days. He said, that's pretty good, that's all right. But I'm wondering, I'm wondering if you die, Jesus, if you die, do you have the power to get your own self up? Do you have the power, do you have all power to be able to resurrect yourself from the dead? Christ smiled and he said, as a matter of fact, follow me on up to Calvary. I'm on my way to Calvary right now. And they, he went up to Calvary and he's up there on that hill and they're taking a hammer and nails and they just pound it into his hands. And they pound the stake through his feet and they put him up on that cross. They took spears and they pierced him in the side until blood is flowing down his body. They're crucifying him. They spit on him. They put a crown of thorns on his head. They're mocking him. They're, they're gambling for his clothes. They're calling him, look at, the, look at this king of kings. Look at him up here on this grave. And after he died, after he died, they took him down and they put him in Joseph's new tomb. And what did they do? They did the same thing they did for Lazarus. They took him and they rolled the stone in front of the grave. And then, and then the devil got happy. You know, the devil got happy because he's like, look, he didn't have as much power as he thought he did. He's just like those... The priest who, who killed him, look at this man. If he, was, if he was who he said he was, he would have been able to get off that cross. Jesus said, I could have called 10,000 legions of angels if I wanted to. If he had enough power, he could have saved himself. If he was a son of God, like he said, he could have saved himself. But now look at him. Look at him sitting there in this grave with the tomb rolled in front of him. You know, and Satan party. He partied the whole weekend, Friday and Saturday night. He thought he had victory, and he stopped back by the grave one early Sunday morning. And when he looked at the grave, he saw that the tomb had ran away, and he's looking at the, he's looking at the grave, and he's like, what, what happened here? What ha how did this happen? We, I saw him put his body in there, and he, he peeks inside, and he sees on the shelf where his body was laid that the fold, his clothes are folded up nicely. And he's, he's looking around, he's questioning everybody, what happened? How did this happen? And the grave starts talking to him. He's like, I, I tried my best. I didn't know what else to do. I, I just tried to keep him down. I tried to hold him. I couldn't hold him. And there was just a rumbling and a tumbling. And all of a sudden, the last thing I remember, remember him saying was, all power under heaven and earth belongs to me. And Jesus got up and he walked out of that grave. He brought himself back from the dead. He resurrected himself. He, there is victory in Christ. Amen. He's waiting on you to move the stone. We pray for so many things and we want God to do so many things in our life, but we have a stone in the way. You, you, you want him to do this thing for you, you want him to do that thing for you, but here you are running around sinning. 
Here you are running around at the bar every night, getting the toe down from the floor down. He said, beat up from the feet up? Where? He waited for Lazarus to be stinking dead. No matter how stinking bad your life may be, Christ, through all those demonstrations, is trying to tell you, have faith in me. I have the power to bring you back. He has the power to bring you back this morning. If you've struggled in your life, if you're struggling in your life, and you want to have the access to that power for him to bring you back from the dead, all you have to do is move the stone away. He wants you to believe in him. He wants you to believe, just like Mary and Martha, they, they lose their faith sometimes. And don't we all lose our faith sometimes as Christians? It happens to us all the time. We, we, it's easy to speak on faith, but it's hard to practice faith. It's hard to have that Abraham faith when you're about to just do whatever it is that God told you to do because he told you to do it. He's about to sacrifice his own son because he has that much faith in the Lord. He knows that no matter what the circumstances may be, no matter how grim the situation may be, he's going to take care of you. Amen. That's the kind of belief, that's the kind of faith that Christ wants you to have. He says to you, how many times do I have to keep showing you over and over and over again? He wants you to believe that. And if you believe that, you repent. You turn your life around. Because don't you want to be living a life that's lined up to be worthy of such, such power? Don't you want to live a life that you can say, no matter what I do, he's going to take care of it because I'm doing the things I'm supposed to be doing the right way? You repent and you confess that. You need to tell everybody about that. No matter where you go, you need to tell them. When you see people going through hard times, when you see them str struggling with alcoholism, drug addictions, st struggling in their marriages, struggling in their finances, and they don't know where else to turn. We deal with people like that every single day, especially in the mil military. Dealing with depression, don't know what else to do. Let that person know where you can't no more, God can. And they should be able to see that through your life. They should be able to see that when you go through these hard times that you don't fall off the straight and narrow. You keep your eyes focused on Christ. I like the way President Obama said it the other night at the, at the convention when he, when he said his speech. And you might not like Obama, and you may like him, but that doesn't matter. Because what he said, you know, what, what I thought was brilliant. He said, the road that we travel is harder and longer, but it leads to a better place. It's easy to go on the easy road. It's easy to take the route where everybody else is going. It's easy to follow your friends doing the wrong thing. But if you stay on the straight and narrow, if you endure through the night, your joy will come in the morning. He wants you to move the stone, and the final thing that you do is go down into the watery grave a baptism. You put away that old life. You put away the, the things that you used to be doing. And when, you, when he puts you down in that water, he's washing away all those old sins that are covering you up. He's washing away those sins that are separating you from the power of God. Sin separates you from God. The wages of sin is what? Death. 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 Through that baptism, he puts you down there. That old life is buried and you come up in the newness of life. The stone has been rolled away, and you are walking hand in hand with Jesus, who has all power in his hands. If you are subject to the invitation, we ask you to come now, or we together stand and sing.